Hello, and welcome to the IDVs podcast for November the 13th, 2020. This is episode number 32. Today, we'll be talking about, among other things, going hands-on with a Nissan Aria, the BMW iX reveal, the launch of the Ford e-Transit, and Rivian's official vehicle pricing. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EV's editor and Inside EV's forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, Inside EV's editor and also host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge with Tom Malogny. Uh, we don't have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily Podcast this morning. He had a not too serious medical emergency to deal with, uh, but we do have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Studio family of YouTube channels. He also puts together the superb videos for the Inside EV's YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. All right, so lots of stuff this week, uh, big stuff. Uh, one of the most highly anticipated electric crossover SUVs is the Nissan Aria. And this week, Kyle here got a chance to climb all over it and push most of its buttons. I recommend that you check out the video of his shenanigans on the Inside EV's YouTube channel after you finish watching the podcast, of course. Um, so, but before we unmute his mic, I'll just remind you that the uh, Nissan Aria is expected to begin selling first in Japan next summer and then other markets, including the US, before the end of 2021. It will be available with either a 65 kilowatt hour battery or a 90 kilowatt hour battery and also in either front wheel drive or all wheel drive uh, e-force uh, drivetrain. It starts at about $40,000 and is still el eligible for the federal $7,500 tax credit. So, all right, Kyle, tell us about being one of the first non-Japanese journalists to get up close with the Nissan Aria. Right, that was so cool. We are very early on in the Nissan Aria uh, evaluation phase and uh, lucky that we got to spend some time with it. Um, you know, I went into this with pretty limited expectations. We talked about it on last show, how I felt, you know, the Leaf was a pretty lackluster product, mostly due to the thermal management. Um, but things looked promising for the Aria, but I wasn't quite sure how it was going to fit in with ID4 or Mustang Mach-E, especially because uh, this is some tight competition here, so Nissan really needs to do some interesting things. And while I didn't really get to spend uh, a ton of time with the car, I spent a solid hour and a half or maybe two hours with it, really going through all of the features and and, and touching every surface and figuring out how it's going to be put together. Uh, you know, you could tell that Nissan is working extremely hard to up their quality. And uh, this is something I was super impressed with because uh, especially coming from the Leaf and other Nissan products I've driven over the years, uh, jumping into this next generation uh, showcase, it, it feels so much better than even their current Infinity models. And I was pretty impressed with the uh, fit finish, specifically the door opening and closing. If you watch my quick walk around video, I did about 20 minutes uh, around the car. And uh, again, it was very impromptu, just camera and me going through everything. Um, you know, the door opening and closing was solid. And that's a great indication as to how the car is going to be built going forward. So, you know, it means the door is nice and chunky. And again, it's a pre-production car. Will that make it to production? I don't know. But at least the intent from the Nissan engineers is to bring a high quality functioning product to market. Um, a few standout highlights to me, I have a video going up today on our brand new out of spec reviews channel, which is the 11 things you need to know about the Aria. It, it'll go through pretty much everything I talked about here. So if you listen to this, don't click on that video. Um, it's just double the info. You will have uh, CCS charging instead of Chatamo. Big news here. Uh, you know, this is, this is massive. Yeah. This is the, the last battery electric vehicle mass produced and sold in the US uh, with Chatamo is now uh, basically being trumped by the Aria, which will have CCS. Now the Leaf will still be sold alongside of Aria, I'm told, uh, which is gonna be a tough uh, sell, I think, especially for the higher trim Leafs. And um, they're gonna have to rely on a lot of dealer incentives to move those Leafs, I think, because the Aria is just a, a really a whole generation ahead. But for example, like in my state in Colorado, you can lease a leaf for $86 a month with $86 down, and that includes taxes, fees, reg, everything. I mean, it's just a free car at that point. It's cheaper than a cell phone bill. So that's where it starts yeah. to really make some sense. 
Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, rather than running through all of it, I think the, the highlights for me are, are, are CCS, thermal management, build quality, interior space, um, and, and overall, uh, uh, ADAS seems really nice, this pilot assist, uh, sorry, that's Volvo's system, I always get them all mixed up, it's ProPilot. Uh, yeah. They'll actually do lane changes and take you off the exits at the highways, and, uh, and it's eye tracking, so you don't need to touch the wheel for in-lane uh, driving, so... I think they're doing a really good job here. How does it stack up against ID4 or Mustang Mach-E though? That's going to be the tough thing because as a standalone product, this is really yeah. nice. And I was super impressed. But when we park the two vehicles next to it and even a Model Y for the, some of those higher trims, I'm not so sure it packs the punch to really keep up. But of course, we'll have to do the test ourselves. Well, the, the interior is quite, quite nice. You, how, would you, how would you compare like the ID4 interior to the Aria interior? Well, I haven't seen the ID4 yet. I'm driving it on Monday, so it's a little bit too early. So next week, I'll be able to make the comparison. And then I'm driving the Mustang Mach-E right after the ID4. So I'll have all, all right. three crossovers fresh in my head with videos coming out on them. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Tom spent some time with the ID4. So can you give us a, an impression on ID4's build quality, interior feel? Volkswagen's always pretty good at this. Yeah, I, I, I wish I had the opportunity that you had. I'm a little jealous to, to get some seat time or at least check out the uh, the Aria so I could do a, a comparison. Um, but, you know, I did get to drive the ID4 around New York City for about an hour. And uh, I was very impressed, as as I noted in the, the video and the uh, articles up on, on Inside EVs. Um, the interior was typical Volkswagen. It was very, like, I don't want to say basic, but basic, you know, but That's very hard. functional. Um, very, very, you know, everything did what you needed it to do and was laid out very, uh, you know, efficiently, uh, wasn't a luxury. I, I think the, the Aria, uh, is probably going to be like a little bit of a step up in comfort and luxury, uh, you know, and, and that's how it's going to, um, differentiate itself between say the ID4. Uh, I, you know, I, again, we talked about this in a previous show, I'm still confused uh, a little bit as to where the Aria fits in, in this class of these, you know, small crossover or mid-sized crossovers that uh, we have with the Model Y, the ID4, the Mustang Mach-E, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, the Model Y is going to have the Tesla fans and the high performance uh, people that are looking for for really like a, a, a performance vehicle. And then that's going to spill over for the Mach-E where performance, maybe somebody that wants uh, one of these vehicles from a more established brand, there's still a, a, a section of the population that really isn't sold on Tesla yet. They're Ford fans or whatever BMW fans, and they prefer to stick with the brand that they're familiar with. They know the guy, you know, that works at the service counter and, and you know, they feel comfortable with that. So we're going to, these legacy brands like Nissan, Volkswagen, and Ford are going to get some customers by default, people that are just loyal to that brand. But Nissan needs to go get more than that. They need to pull people in from other brands. And I'm, I was, until I get some time driving the Aria and really sit in it, I'm still trying to figure out where they're going to get those, how they're going to take customers, say, from Volkswagen or Ford, you know, to get them into the Aria. I, I, I haven't been able to figure out exactly what their angle is and what they do better than these other vehicles that to me on paper, at least, and after driving the Model Y and driving the uh, ID4 and driving in a Mach-E, I haven't driven it yet, but I've driven in one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I need some time in the Aria to try to figure out where their customers are gonna come from. Right now, I really don't see it. I'm not saying it's gonna flop and it's not gonna sell, but I think the the other three are have competitive advantages at this point and, and are probably gonna do better. Uh, than the Aria. That's just my opinion, but I still need to get some seat time in it and drive it. Maybe my opinion will change. Yeah, well, look at uh, in the comment sections on the videos that we post. You know, Tom, I, I feel the same way you do. I, I don't see the competitive advantage. I don't see the wow factor. There's nothing that sticks out to the Aria that says this is either better or less expensive than the others. So it's uh, it just seems to be right in the middle of the mix to me. It's not a bad car. Standalone, again, fantastic vehicle, 
we may be impressed when we start putting up it up against ID4 and Mustang Mach-E, but these are uh, vehicles that are going to be company halo cars for them. The Aria is not being positioned as a company halo car. This is their next EV. It's really nice. But most people that went to the same studio that I did were there to see the Z Proto sports car, uh, which is awesome, by the way. Huge fan of that, but not an EV. So we can't talk about it, unfortunately. But they're making something interesting. Uh, the the uh, thing with the Aria is it's forty grand for the base one. We right. don't know what how much it's going to cost for the big battery, the all wheel drive, and the SL trim. This could be sixty sixty five thousand dollars. Again, this is pure speculation. When we start getting up into that money, you have Volvo XC forty. You have premium options. You have used e trons. Used e trons are already fifty grand, by the way. You have used I-PACEs that are coming down to almost high 30s. So, like, what you know, you, you got to balance all of this stuff. And um, I don't know. I think Nissan's going to have to have a good lease special on this car to get them to move. Oh, what's the price of the? Uh, what's the base price of the ID4? Thirty nine nine, and that's so, with the current larger battery pack. In in two in a year and a half, I think it is the the sm- smaller pack is going to be made in the U.S. and it's going to be thirty five. Right, so, thirty five grand, and still yeah. qualifies for the tax credit by that point. We expect, yeah. So it's so, right in there with price wise with, with the Volkswagen. But the I, I think the the design of the Aria and maybe the materials and everything I think is a little bit better than the, the Volkswagen at least an, initially. Hmm, I feel the exact opposite. Now, really? Dominic, you've always been a fan of the Aria. You've been standing up for it. You've yes. certainly been its wingman here. So, can you explain what? appeals to you specifically about aria because even after spending time with it again impressed really liked it would i buy one over uh, an id4 or mustang mach e still i i need to experience those cars unless there's something blatantly bad about them i think my answer is no uh, and maybe that's just the sporting credentials inside of me or the german car lover inside of me but um yeah i'm really curious to see what appeals to you about aria that maybe tom and i are missing well, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the exterior design, like the front end, the V motion carryover from you know its legacy vehicles. I'm not really a big fan of, of that, but you know it's it's fine. Um, I do like the color, the, the copper color going on. Yeah, on that this. was a beautiful color combo. Hundred percent agree with their launch specification. In person, it had so much depth. It it really was a nice color. Right, but the interior design is really what I kind of like. I like the uh, the wood panel across the front with the with the buttons inlaid inside. Um, was that and the center console moving back and forth? Was that that's you showed that right? That was the yeah, area. Yeah, it's nice, but it's kind of one of those things where once you get it set where you want it, why would you ever move it again? So I that's mean, true. It, that's it's true. It's certainly it's cool. It's like interesting, but I think they did it just to have something interesting in the car because everything else is pretty unremarkable. Honestly, it's nice. The heads-up display is bright and clear. The screens are bright and large and clear. But again, right. this doesn't set it apart from any of its competition. Everyone has bright and clear screens. So I think this moving center console is like a wow factor. Uh, right. And the carpets were really nice, but the right. haptic controls weren't for me. They they thought that that was a really cool thing, and I'm sure some people will like that. It just felt unpremium that the whole center console wood piece has to move in, like in half an inch or a quarter of an inch to actually select the button. And maybe it will be buttoned down better on the production version, but I was pretty disappointed with that that feeling. Uh, I'm just not a fan of haptic controls in general. Like Volkswagen Audi Group products have them in their screens. I turn all that off anyway. I don't like the the fake feedback. Um, but again, there's nothing bad. Like it, uh, that's about it. I mean, the, the backseat room was comfortable. You get a lot of right. features sitting in the car is great. I'm sure driving it's going to be as expected. So uh, there's no negatives to me to the car. It ticks all the right boxes, but there's also I missed, I missed nothing a- like exciting that makes me really have an emotional connection to say, Oh, I want to drive this. Right. I think once you will, once you do drive it, I think you'll like it because uh, they spent a lot of time on that drive, that E Force drivetrain with the, the, the dynamics. It's got uh, torque vectoring, uh, anti dive, you know, anti, you know, taking off. They, you know, they try to keep the, the car. It's working always, working the two motors together to keep the car like even, not pitching or diving. And through the turns, it it really um, it decreases the turning radius uh, at speed. 
with that system activated i drove it in a uh, it was a nissan leaf but it had the like, divorce drivetrain inside of it in like a big parking lot situation um but do you yeah. think that's any different than the all-wheel drive mach e or model y or id4 or any of these other all-wheel drive systems uh based on what i'm reading it doesn't seem to be calibrated for performance uh any differently than than the other systems would be and probably the most uh, highest performance calibration will be the Mustang Mach E out of the yeah. entire lineup. Right. I, yeah, I expect the Mach E to have more sporty characteristics for sure, mm -hmm. but the Aria should have poise that I'm not sure the other ones will quite have. Interesting. Well, look, it would be the first Nissan product I've ever driven with poise. So uh, I really hope they can accomplish that. Uh, although, actually, that's not true because I did. Uh, have a quick little jaunt in their rogue sport up in the canyons and we shredded it and it was actually really good. So I, I have really, uh, uh, you know, my, my low expectations have opened up. Let's just say I'm more open to the Aria. I'm very right. pleased about it. Uh, and, and I think the driving is going to really seal the deal for me. If it drives great, then it might set itself apart from the others, but you know, none of the numbers on paper are that amazing. 300 miles of range. Okay. Everyone's doing that. You have, uh, you know, uh, all wheel drive. Okay. Everyone's doing that 130 kilowatt DC fast charging and eh, like good, not bad again, right. but not, it's not, you know, 270, 300. It doesn't need to be either. It's, it's a perfect, I think, balance of charge rate. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's where my thoughts are with the Aria. I'm very excited to drive ID4 uh, in three days in uh, Detroit. Yeah. It'll be really nice. And then, um, yeah, big travel week over here. We've been on the go driving cars, so uh, lots to keep down. i got to write down all my thoughts on them before I start getting the candy mixed up with the Lucid Air. <laughs> yeah, right. One of the things that Kyle mentioned before that I think is really important is how Nissan gets behind the Aria. Um, you yeah. know, we know that uh, Volkswagen and Ford are all in on these two vehicles. That is a fact. You know, Ford is Ford gave it the name the Mustang. So enough said. You know, they 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 almost can't let it flop. We know right. that they're going to be marketing the hell out of it. We know they're going to be making and as many as they can, sending them to the dealers, telling their dealers to promote this vehicle, put it right in the center of the showroom. We, that that's going to happen. Volkswagen. I had a long conversations with Volkswagen product managers. This is their beetle of the 21st century. They literally told me that. The ID4 is a car that they want to sell millions of, not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. They want to sell millions of ID4s. So you know they're going to put the weight of the brand behind it. They're going to be helping the dealers. They're going to be telling them how to market it. You know, the, the electric vehicles still, you know, we talk about them like, you know, everybody knows electric vehicles because we know them. We've been driving them for years, but still, you know, 90 percent of the population still really doesn't understand these vehicles. They need help. And if the manufacturers doesn't don't get behind the cars, don't give the dealers the tools they need to sell them, don't spend money marketing them. Uh, it's not going to do well. You know what? You know, you can send as many of these cars as you want to Nissan dealers. And if you don't tell the story, if you don't help the dealer sell them, they're going to go push to the back of the lot. They're going to be blocked in by seven or eight cars. When somebody comes in, hey, you know, I'm interested in that that area. Yeah, I think we got them in the back. Let, let me move a couple cars to get to them. And they get there. The battery's dead. It, it's a disaster. We've seen this before on with, with many of the, the earlier cars. So, you know, I'm putting a lot on Nissan here. If they want this vehicle to be competitive in this highly competitive segment right now they're going to have to get behind it and uh and and i i don't know i don't know if they're ready to do that yet we'll we'll have to wait and see we know their competitors are going to and that's going to tell a, a big part of the story on which vehicles are most successful yeah well new, nissan is kind of it seems like it's struggling of, of late anyway it's kind of so uh, yeah i agree with tommy completely this is it really needs to get behind this vehicle and man I just, I just wanted it to succeed so bad because I, you know, looking at it here now on the screen, man, it looks so good. Um, let's let's move on. But if you do get a chance, definitely so go. That, that's where we differ, I think, because in person, nothing about this said it looks so good, and I would say the front end is poor. Uh, but I've been saying that all along, of right. course. You know, it's this and the Cadillac Lyric for me do nothing. But it's just that giant unused front grill area for right. no reason other than stylistic purposes seems it's, untrue to 
a ground up designed EV. Also, one thing that really bugs me about this car, and again, not to be negative, because I think my walk around was actually really positive on the car. So I wanted yeah. to share some of my after thinking about it a few days, uh, not necessarily corrections, but the thoughts that I've been thinking of, uh, you know, not at, at being, you know, first impression five minutes with the car. Uh, why is a ground up electric vehicle design shared across multiple manufacturers again? Why is the two wheel drive configuration front wheel drive? This should not be a thing. It, it, front wheel drive yeah. EVs are extremely compromised uh, with high torque, getting the power down. We've seen this in Kona. We've seen it in Nero. Really, only the Mini Cooper SE is probably the, the truly only example that can handle a front wheel drive well without just tons of torque steer. And that's because it doesn't have a lot of power. So this should be rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. And I think that's something that's really going to set apart the ID4 and the Mustang Mach-E in the base configurations when compared against this, especially in a lot of our tests, which, you know, we do a lot of back road canyon driving and track tests. They're not track vehicles, but it is good to understand vehicle dynamics. That's where this, I think, is going to gonna lack. Do you have thoughts on that, Dominic? Because E4 sounds great, right. but what about the base one? Because I think a lot of people will choose the entry-level version of this. Yeah, I think I think it's great that they have the entry level option, but um, with you, I don't know why anyone makes a, a front wheel drive electric car. It doesn't make you know. I mean, I own one, and yeah, and and now I'm starting to think I'm only twenty thousand miles on on the odometer right now, but I'm already thinking, okay, coming out of a turn, don't really hit the accelerator until it, the steering straightened up because I don't want to you know wear out my the, the, the axles or whatever. You know, it's like, okay, go make sure, you know, try, I'm trying to treat it nicely so it lasts, you know, a long time. Um, yeah, so, but I'm, I think if I was buying it, I would definitely recommend the E-Force package. Hopefully it's not super expensive. I'm, I'm hoping five grand extra. I'm hoping they I hope, yeah, somewhere 2,500 and you can get it with the small battery, which is huge news. That's great. Right, right. That's, so that's where you can that. save a bit of money. You get to spring for the E-Force but maybe stick with a small battery unless you're doing a lot of long distance driving. Yeah. Nissan claims that the 130 kilowatt DC fast charging peak rate is the same for both battery packs, which on one hand sounds great. On the other, it means right. why wouldn't you make the fast one charge faster? But, uh, you know, I don't know. And that's just what they claim. Again, this is, uh, uh, uh they're the PR spokes, persons we didn't have time with the engineers i will be doing a, a call with the engineers of aria dominic i'd love to have you join tom maybe as well maybe we can have like a separate not podcast podcast yeah. episode where we dive in with them uh, that'd be super interesting so uh because yeah. i know you would have a lot more questions than i do especially after experiencing e-force and having more experience with the drivetrain of the car right yeah okay we're already 23 minutes in and we, we can't go too long today. So let's see, let's, let's line this next story up. So the next vehicle we're, we want to talk about is not the sexiest electric vehicle, but I think it's an important one. Uh, it's the Ford E-Transit. It made its debut earlier this week and it's really engineered for work. It's based on the internal combustion version of the van and it comes in three different roof, roof heights and different lengths. The battery, which it uses the same LG cells in the uh, found in the Mustang Mach-E, but in a different pack, it's got 67 kilowatt hours usable, which they say is good for 126 miles of range or 202.7 kilometers uh, in the low roof version. The electric motor puts out 266 horsepower and uh, 317 pound-feet of torque to the back wheels, which is similar to the internal combustion version, maybe a, maybe a bit more going on there. Uh, and apparently the rear drive and suspension was redesigned so it wouldn't impinge on the cargo space. The cargo area in the back, is, it's exactly the same as the ICE version, that's the internal combustion engine version. Uh, that's important because most of these will be sent to an upfitter after leaving the Ford factory in Kansas City, Missouri, and have like shelves or other accessories installed in the back. Uh, so they can use the same parts they've already engineered for the original transit. So that's, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, importantly, the price is supposed to start at under $45,000. So, Tom, did you have a look, chance to look this thing over here? Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of electric delivery vans. I've said it on the podcast a few times. You know, I, 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 I think there's an opportunity for adoption uh, to, to accelerate faster for this segment than what we've seen with uh, passenger vehicles, because it just makes so much sense that the total cost of ownership 
is going to be so much less than than what it will be on on conventional ice vehicles that you know that fleet managers are just going to go crazy over these things i have two partners that uh, uh that that own businesses that have been pestering me for a couple of years saying when when can i get electric delivery vans um now unfortunately for the two of them i think this is going to be a little insufficient because they're both looking for something that would do um, about 150 to 175 miles of range because they they typically, their vans mostly drive around 100 to 110 miles a day. So they need a little extra um, cushion there for the cold weather. And also when when it's filled with cargo, we don't know how much of, of, of a range hit that's gonna take. So my initial impression was I was a little disappointed about the range, but I understand that this, the, 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 this amount of range, will be fine for so many people. Uh, not everybody needs 150, 175 miles of range. The, many of these delivery vehicles go 30, 40, 50 miles a day, that's it. And uh, it kind of makes sense for Ford to come out with this one first. Um, you know, it's kind of like the low hanging fruit. It's easier, it's gonna be less expensive. And then battery cells, as they just continue to lower in a, in a couple of years, they can come out with one with that larger battery, that 100 kilowatt hour battery, 125 kilowatt hour battery, that's gonna, you know, do, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40% more range. And then they'll be able to uh, offer this to more businesses. Uh, but, you know, it, the specs look great. Um, super excited about this. Uh, I, I've been waiting so long to get a really good, competent electric delivery vehicle. Ford saying that the overall total cost of ownership will be 40% less than their conventional ICE counterparts. That is like, if, if, if you're not a fleet manager, if you don't operate a business, that that you know has uh, you know transportation costs delivery vehicles maybe you don't realize how big that is you know as I mentioned earlier I have two partners that that own businesses one's a vending company they they service like you know ten thousand vending machines the other one is a, a ice cream distributorship they distribute they're one of the biggest ice cream distributors in in the tri-state area um, so they're all over the place their fleet they're they spend like. 50,000 a month on gas, like, you know, uh, uh, and diesel. So, you know, think about what they, the potential they savings they have just in fueling, let alone the maintenance where the vehicles are just constantly need tune-ups, the mufflers fall off, you know, they vibrate and fall off. Uh, the, 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 they would jump at a 10% savings, jump at it. Sure. And, and Ford's saying 40% less. So, I mean, the upside for these, for businesses is enormous. And then what, what I love about it is you're going to see these businesses use these vehicles, the, the drivers that drive them daily, the fleet managers, the people that work in the company, they're going to be so impressed by them. They're going to go out and buy an electric car or an electric SUV for their family. So yeah. this is kind of like a litmus test where it's going to expose electric transportation to thousands and thousands of people who are they're going to say, geez, we're saving so much for the business. I should I should be doing this for my family. So um, you know I'm really excited about electric delivery vans uh, for a number of reasons, and uh, I like what Ford put out here, and uh, I think it's going to really really have a huge impact on how people view electric transportation. Yeah, Kyle, you like this too, right? Oh, I am in love with this. I this is like the vehicle for me. So, you know, we're planning a lot of trips in 2021 uh, for our out-of-spec motoring outlet where we're going to be going on on big trips. You know, we'll have to keep an eye on what borders are open, what's safe to do, of course. But at least in the near-term future, we are um, doing uh, a Montana trip, doing things with zero. We're going to be going across the country a few times on dirt. And so we're going to try and really push the adventure side of things. And what we need for that is a vehicle that can be a support vehicle we need uh chargers in there we need battery storage we probably need a diesel generator as you know for going out in the middle of nowhere and to have something that's electric carry all that could be really interesting um the other flip side of this is how about turning one of these into a adventure camper right we see so many people with these lifted sprinters especially sure. where i am now in colorado they all go out hang out in the rocky mountains four-wheel drive big knobby tires and I'm like, I would love that, but I kind of don't want the diesel one. 
And yeah. so now we have the opportunity to turn a fantastic chassis of the Transit. I've spent a lot of time in the gas versions of these, and they drive actually really well. Now we're putting in a pretty interesting drivetrain that's electric. Sounds like a pretty cool off-roading camping uh, vehicle to me. Solar panels on the roof. And if it takes five days to charge it, you live out of your van. Who cares? So, uh, you know, that's kind of the best part. I love this. I, actually, with a the, with the battery in the, in the bottom, it should handle even better than the, the gas version. It should have a better road feel. But, yeah, uh, I but, agree. It, it, we've always seen this from EVs, especially the the chassis that accommodate both internal combustion and battery electric, that the battery electric versions feel much more nimble and planted at around town and highway speeds. So, uh, right. you know, big, big hopes for this one. Really can't wait to spend some time with it. Um, actually kind of want one for myself, for the company. We, we're always moving cars around. We're moving stuff around. This could be a really interesting option. But again, it's just the first step. If other manufacturers see that right. this is successful for Ford, you are going to unlock the floodgates because this is such an untapped market, like Tom was saying. Well, this is a worldwide vehicle. So they also it's also going to be in Europe where they already have the Volkswagen e-crafter, which is doesn't have the the specs this has, and it's like really it's like eighty thousand euros, or it's like really expensive. Quite expensive! Wow, the e-craft is like cool. nuts. I didn't realize there was so much. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So this this is you know has a clear road pretty much ahead of it, like the world over. Uh, it has a really high WLTP rating in Europe as well too. I think they I think they're capping the speed at ninety kilometers an hour, which is what uh, 80, 50, 55 ish, I think. Mm -hmm. So actually, and I don't know the uh, top speed of the, the North American one. I, that's something we should probably look into. Uh, it's got to be higher than they can just do 55. They would, they would put that in the press release. I think would, I would, I would hope if it's limited in that, in that sense. But, uh, but as you're saying, like for a camping vehicle, I don't know, 126 miles. I think it's kind of, it kind of limits you. I think it kind of puts this really as a, an in city work vehicle where, you know, um, Ford decided on this, well, one, they wanted to keep the total cost of, of ownership down. So they want to keep that initial price low. So, you know, 60 was 67 kilowatt hours. It, it's a fair, fairly good size battery, but 126 miles. So they, um, they worked with uh, their fleet customers and they looked at the data of like 30 million customer miles and they found that like 74 miles, 75 miles was like the sweet spot, like the average. So I, I think 126 is kind of cutting it a little close because you have winter to, to deal with. And this is also for the low roof version. The high roof version is going to be less efficient, of course. And, and longer versions might be, you know, or heavier and so less efficient. So, I, I, man, 126 is kind of cutting it a little bit closer, I feel like. But, you know, I... I they got to know what they're doing. They're putting a lot of uh, uh, resources into this program. They're refitting the uh, Kansas City, Missouri plant to produce them. And so I th you got to hope they know what they're doing. They got. They said they were pretty. They're pretty pumped. They had you know customers lined up, and customers are excited about this. And uh, yeah, should be great. Uh, anyone have any questions, Tommy? Any questions? Yeah, I agree that they're cutting it close. I mentioned that earlier, uh, mm. but I'm sure they did their homework on this. I mean, it's it kind of sounds a little bit like, you know, BMW for years has been, ha had been saying, uh, well, the average person drives 40 miles a day, so an 80 mile EV is fine. But we all know that you, you, you can't go on the average day because every now and then you have a day that, you know, you double or triple your average day. And then all of a sudden, oh, wow, it doesn't work. And it's more important for a work truck than you know than than even your personal vehicle um, that it has to be able to do the duty. So hopefully Ford is going to give guidance to their customers on this and not let somebody well you know advise them not to buy it if it's if it doesn't fit their that you know their needs. Now the the good thing about it is these fleet managers have from for at least the larger companies have great data and that they can literally see you know okay two days out of the month, the vehicle went more than a hundred miles. You know, they, they have all that. They're not guessing like individuals, people typically don't know how far they need to drive. You know, they assume they need more miles than what they do. But when they, when they really, you know, look at it, they realize, Oh yeah, maybe I don't need a 300 mile EV. I always recommended 
uh, if you were considering buying an EV, to have a little book in your car and every day reset your trip odometer and then record it. Um, and then at the end of a couple of months, look and see how many days you actually drove longer than what that that EV that you were considering uh, the ranges. Now, fleet managers have all that data, so they'll easily be able to see, oh yeah, this will work for me or it won't work for me. I just think we have to factor in the things that the the, the extended roof is going to cut uh, some of the range off, and also cargo. You know, if you're if you're carrying, um, you know, like my, my partners, if they if if they're carrying, you know, eight hundred pounds of ice cream, how 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 many how many miles of range is going to get cut off in the winter when it's ten degrees? So hopefully Ford has that data and and can present it to the the, the potential purchasers and say, look, you know. Uh, for every, you know, 200 miles of cargo, you know, you're going to lose 10 miles of range. For every 10 degrees of of, uh, of temperature drop under 50 degrees, you're going to lose 10 miles of range. So they can kind of look at that and say, okay, yeah, this still works for me. Even in the worst case situation, it's just at the edge of the furthest we need this vehicle to drive. If they don't and they have customers buy these and then they fail to be able to give them the utility they need, now it's a problem because now you've got the fleet men and say, oh, these electric vehicles stink. Like, you know, I tried to get one half of the time. They didn't work. I just hope Ford does the, does this right and, and explains to the customers what it work, what will work and what won't. And um, if they do that, then I think you're going to have happy customers. Right. And of course, this, this isn't Ford's first electric van. They did have the e-transit connect back in like 2010, I believe. Or, and that we use the Azure Dynamics uh, drive train powertrain, which was kind of iffy, and it also had I think uh, was it Borg? No, I can't remember if it was Borg Warner, uh, Borg Warner or Bosch. But the the drive unit itself, they had a lot of failures with those. Uh, Jack over ETV uh, used to keep, uh, you know, used, sold a lot of those units. He he bought a you know bunch in stock and has been resupplying uh, tran Transit Connect, you know, owners with with those over over the last few years. Um, yeah. So, and just real quickly, um, because this is a work van, it does have, you know, an, an outlet in the back, so you can plug things in and do some work, you know, if you wanted to plug in your, your I think they showed like a, not a skill saw, but like a little portable table saw in, in the video uh, from Ford, yeah. So, it, you know, it's a, it's for doing work. And yeah, it remain, we'll see how that works out. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I'm kind of hoping the Get it be nice to take it on the track too, right? You could see doing a one lap in that, uh, Kyle. Oh, we're doing a one lap for sure. You know, one thing is <laughs> is for certain is Ford's EV communications team is fantastic. We have a great relationship yeah. with them. They will let us do some interesting things with their cars. Uh, and look, this is something that really excites us uh, and, and really excites me, not only from just the, the bean counter perspective, as Tom would say, from the numbers and, the, uh, and everything for a business, but this is really the first Americanly available, is Americanly a word? First it available in the U.S. market uh, <laughs> a, a van that people can deliver, flower shops, pizza delivery, you name it. Uh, this is the first. This is the start of a new right. era. And look, you can't fault Ford here because they are really going hard in electrification. They're putting right. a Mustang badge on their flagship EV, and they're launching the first uh, uh, transit vehicle here in the U.S., first uh, box vehicle. I'm so excited. Can't wait to spend some time with it. And uh, it's all positives for me. The range doesn't seem like it's a huge deal. I think uh, you need at great communication with your fleet managers that are going to be communicating with the drivers. It is all customer education here. And as long as that path is sorted, and a lot of that falls on the individual managers of the company, as long as they understand the limitations of the vehicle, they build out a charging network that works for them. So you have one at your delivery hub, you have one at the stores, whether it's all DC charging or AC charging. I think it really has a lot of use cases. Now, it's not perfect. Like Tom said, it doesn't work for everyone. It's limited range. But even I think there's enough use cases to sell every single one of these that they can make. And it does charge pretty fast. Too. I don't have the rates here on me in front of me, but I remember seeing them and thinking, man, that's pretty good. You know, you could run up to a DC fast charge and 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 get to an extra thirty whatever miles pretty quickly if you needed to. But yeah, but yeah. Uh, 
it was 115 kilowatt dom sorry to interrupt you mm -hmm. dc fast is at 115 which like you said it, let's say the 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 van looks like it's going to be a little short on range because they they made a couple more stops than they thought they were going to make um if if there's an available dc fast charger you're literally stopping for 10 minutes 15 minutes and uh you know you're going to add enough range to finish your route and get back to the uh, base so right. you know that works it's infrastructure though we need the infrastructure which is coming right that's inside towns too and that's part of like the ev go plan where they're going to be building a lot of uh, dc fast charging inside the cities so yeah that will be one network for for people to look at for that but uh, we need to move on real quick if it's all right in any more any more points we want to make about this okay we're good so arguably another important vehicle was revealed this week the BMW iX crossover SUV. This is the production version of the iNext concept. And if you're familiar with that car, you'll recognize the grill of the iX right away. And everyone has an opinion about it. Uh, beaver teeth. Uh, the BM BMW iX is uh, about the length of the BMW X5, the height of the X6, and it wears the same size wheels as the X7, uh, apparently. And uh, so, saying that it's still in the series production development phase they haven't released exact specs of, of everything but we do know the all-wheel drive system will put out over 500 500 torquey horses uh, which will get about 62 miles an hour in under five seconds i would say probably comfortably under five seconds i'm guessing uh, the battery is said to be around 100 kilowatt hours maybe a little larger and it should offer a range of 300 EPA miles or so, or 600 kilometers uh, WLTP. That's 373 miles WLTP. Uh, charging happens at 200 uh, kilowatts at the most. And they say you can add 70% of a charge in 40 minutes or 75 miles in 10 minutes. An earlier report said that the price would be in the neighborhood of $100,000. So this strikes me as a sort of an electric halo vehicle for BMW. Um, Kyle, is this going to be the top dog in the luxury electric class or what? First off, I really want to apologize to our audience for blinding them with this image here on the screen. This is really bad. I don't know what they were thinking. First off, the grill thing, first off, they should have read the comments on any picture BMW has posted on any social media for the last two years about these stupid grills. Now, granted, I have seen the new M3 in person with these grills, and it wasn't as bad. But right. this has really nothing else going for it either. It's kind of got like a Renault McGann back end that like squeezes in. The hood like, it looks like you ate something really sour. Uh, that's the best way to describe this vehicle. Now, the specs all look good, but we don't have any concrete evidence of anything that they can bring to market. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge BMW EV fan, as is Tom. I've owned three i3s. The, you know, BMW is a, is a brand that is so near and dear to my heart uh, that it pains me to see them not doing something so cool. First off, we don't need a big, another electric SUV thing. Sure, it's kind of cool. Are they going to sell them? Maybe. I'm sure Tom has a, maybe a different opinion, but to me, this is just like it. And, and typical with new modern BMWs, they look better in person. So I'm, I take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, uh, this may look amazing in person. There are just some cars that don't look good all the time. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's a little bit painful. I'm going to pull it off the screen here, and I really want to hear Tom's thoughts here because Tom is, for our audience that, that doesn't know, Tom has been involved with the BMW electric vehicle programs for years, from the Mini E to the BMW Active E, and he's pretty humble. He won't tell you all the time, but uh, Tom is like Mr. BMW EV, so this is really his his world, and I, I can't wait to hear what he thinks about it, but from a design perspective, this doesn't do anything for me. Well, show, show us about well, wait for Tom to tell us about the show us a little bit of the interior if you can. Or maybe, yeah, right. So, Tom. <laughs> so, yeah, what's interesting to me is that I participated in a BMW focus group on this vehicle four years ago. And um, I was very critical at that focus group. And uh, I think I was starting to annoy the people there actually that were taking in all the, the questions. So and they, they did this despite you. Yeah, they brought out, <laughs> oh, oh, they had it like lined up next to a Range Rover SUV. I mean, a land, they had a Land Rover. They had the I-Pace wasn't ready yet, but they had like all three, uh, 
a, a virtual reality walk through of the eye pace. They had a, a bunch of competing SUVs there and asked us to really go side by side and compare what you liked about this one, what you didn't like about this one. There was very little that I really liked about it. And it was, it was quite disappointing. And the reason why, and I'll, I'll, let me explain why, B besides that grill that I, it's really, you know, I, I don't want to beat that into the ground, but I, I don't know how anybody could really like that. But I, I know aesthetics is, is uh, something that, you know, can vary from person to person. Um, what I, what disappoints me is, you know, BMW, when they started BMW, I, they really seemed like they were poised to take that next step, that step into the 21st century to reinvent the automobile, you know, from the materials to the sustainable manufacturing, clean sheet of paper, you know, you look at the i3 and obviously you don't say, oh, that's a BMW. I mean, you might now because we've been seeing it for, for five, six years now. Um, but, you know, when it first came out, it was like, whoa, like uh, granted, a lot of people didn't like it. it was a polarizing look. They didn't really associate that with BMW, even even the i8, you know, it, it had BMW Qs, but it was just this totally different vehicle. And I applauded v BMW for doing that, for saying, you know what, electric vehicles are different. Um, and we need to have a different approach. Everything about the car should be different. And, you know, we can, we can incorporate who we are with BMW into the vehicles, but the, it should be the next generation of car. And it seems like they, they've pulled back from that and they, they feel like they were burned a little bit because it, it wasn't as successful as maybe they hoped, even though BMW i3 sales increased virtually every year that the car has been in production, which is very that almost never happens for, right. for seven consecutive years. It's sold more every year than it has the past year. It hasn't done well in the U S but in, in Europe and around the world it has. Um, and with this car, it seems like they've said, okay, you know what? We're just going to um, work off what we're comfortable with. Uh, give it some electric styling and uh, you know, just make uh, a car that, could just as well be a gas car. And notice that long sloping hood on the front. Look at what most electric manufacturer, electric vehicle manufacturers are doing now. Like Lucid, for instance. Um, the, 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 there's no need to have this giant long sloping hood on, on the front of the vehicles anymore. They compress it down. They make the passenger compartment larger and they put in a, a nice size uh, trunk in the front. Uh, and, and that's all it's needed. BMW seems like they're holding on to the past with these long, you know, hoods in the front that are needed for the big engines, these giant grills, which, you know, uh, you know, are like, you know, powerful for large engines that need cooling. You need a big grill to get as much air in there as you can. And it seems like they're just, they're not committing to electrification in my opinion. And I mean, even look, look at that picture we have up there now. Uh, yes, the grill's ugly, but let's say you can get past it. The license plate in the middle of the grill, like how could they that, have not, right? how could they have not figured out a way to not, like if they're so proud of the grill and how it looks, okay, fine, leave it unadulterated, like p make the license plate just under it or somehow. But um, I mean, it, it, if, if, if you didn't hate it already, stick a license plate in the middle of it. And now it like ruins the, it, the aesthetic, if that's what you're going for, but it, it, enough about the grill, just the whole vehicle um, to me is disappointing. I don't hate it as much as Kyle does. I'm not blinded by it and want to look away, but I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. Um, I don't think it's terrible. Um, uh, you know, I just, I don't think it's good enough. I think BMW should have done better. Uh, I think, you know, this was going to be their flagship vehicle. They've been telling us that's going to showcase BMW's technology of the 21st century. This, the, you know, th this was going to be the vehicle. And while I don't hate it, I really wanted to love it. I really wanted to right. say, wow, okay, you know, the, yeah, they get it. Like, like this is, the, you know, all right, BMW is in the game now with electrification. Like they're, they, they're here. And I don't get it with this. I, I, I just see it as, you know, an electric, like BMW just made an electric SUV. And uh, they're saying here, you know, this is what people want. People want what they're comfortable with, with our brand. They don't want it to really be that much different. Um, and okay, may, maybe, they're, maybe they're, their uh, philosophy is better. You know, they've been doing this a long time. Um, maybe it'll prove that, that this is the right path to go. But for me, 
it just it really doesn't do it. I'm 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 disappointed. Yeah. Well, I think uh, in so I'll I'll just uh, stand up. Uh, stick up for the uh, grill for a moment. I think uh, it's obviously very polarizing, and most of the comments I've, I've seen about it haven't been uh, in its favor. But I think it gives it a distinctive look. Look, it it keeps the uh, BMW uh, styling language sort of, but it, it, it's still separate. It's very separate from all the other BMWs with their big grills as well. It's just got its own its own thing going on, and I think that's going to be it's, it makes it distinctive. It makes makes it different. So you can have a BMW, or you can have the, the BMW that everyone knows is like a hundred thousand dollars. So I think they're going for like a status kind of thing, and uh, you can see some of that reflected in interior. The interior looks pretty posh, like that like that center armrest thing with a crystal knob and everything is quite nice. Yeah, All right. I mean that's that's pretty upscale looking. I'm sure the interior you know, is going to be grill. gorgeous. You know, yeah. uh, they do make nice interiors, BMW. Well, first off, look at those blue seatbelts. I love those. You can get them in i3 and i8. Those are just great. I love colored seatbelts. They right. mean that there's something cool about a car. You get in a right. car with black seatbelts, it's not interesting. Uh, but it's not okay. the grill that bugs me about this car so much. It is this um, this front arch. I'm just trying to you scroll back over so I can pull up thing? an image of it really quick. It looks like yeah, right yeah, around here. I don't know. If, can you see my cursor on the screen? For you, the it's this view from like a three quarter, like what we're looking at now, or even a little bit less than a three quarter. It almost looks like it's scrunched. Like why not just extend the width of the whole car? Looking at this car, you know, especially in the B roll, it looks like the cabin and the roof all uh -huh. slope in like it's a giant triangle. And that's the case for almost every BMW, but this is just way overdone. And it's that, uh, narrowness at the top and wideness at the bottom uh, that doesn't work well for me on this. You know, I, I think the new X5 looks good. I'm one of the few people that thinks the new X7 looks really good. Um, and I think the reason is because okay. it's, it's kind of boxy. This, um, I think that's that's my, my issue with it. Specs are fine, but I just can't get over that weird angle. And I'm sure someone will make a bumper like they're going to do for the rest of the cars that will put two traditional style kidney grills in the front as it should right. have been. I do like the headlights. I think they look really nice. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think that all comes together with the, the front. It's going to, you know, it's going to be distinctive. And I think, you know, high-end buyers like having distinctive cars, even if sometimes, you know, us, us plebes kind of look at it and like, uh, I don't know. And, anyway, and what you see the blue valances in the back, like they they right. have to like um, extension, like almost fake you out. Like, well, that there must be a tailpipe in there somewhere. Right. Like that's where the tailpipes would come out. And you know, again, to me, it's like they're they refuse to let go of the past. That's what right. bothers me about this. It's not a terrible looking vehicle. I I don't hate it. I just I just feel like they're refusing to let go of the past. And I had thought they. We're going. I thought they they were past that already with when they started BMW i. I thought that it was a clean sheet. We're going to make you know the cars of the next century, and I, that seems like they backpedaled and 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 they went try to like the the safe way out. And uh, that's what's most disappointing to me. Not that I hate this vehicle, I just I wish it it could have been more. All right. So we we only have a few minutes left here, but I really want to hit this next story because it's, it's like super important one. So. Uh, now, here's some news that thousands of people have been waiting for. The price of the Rivian R1T pickup truck and R1S SUV has been released, at least for the first versions. Uh, now, doing things a little differently than others, Rivian is beginning deliveries of vehicles using its middle size battery first. I believe they call it large, but it's the 135 kilowatt hour pack that should be good for like over 300 miles in either the truck or the SUV. But they also have a 400 mile uh, battery and a 250 mile battery options coming. So, uh, what's the price? Drum roll, please. Okay, the uh, the R1 S SUV starts at seventy thousand dollars for the Explore package. That's the lower one. Uh, pay another seventy five hundred dollars. Uh, just happens to be the same amount of, of the federal tax credit that this is eligible for. Uh, so spend yeah spend the $7,500 and you get either the launch edition that begins shipping in August of 2021 next summer or the adventure edition, which leaves the factory in normal Illinois in January of 2022. Both of these editions have an upgraded stereo 
ash wood interior finishes instead of Mac black, uh, heated and ventilated seats. And just, instead of just heated, um, a microfiber headliner and fancy chill, witch floor mats and the launch edition will come in, in green and have special interior badging and a 22 sport wheel upgrade over the 20 inch wheels included. If you want them, uh, the pickup truck now is a little cheaper and starts at 67, five for the Explorer edition and 75,000 for the adventure and launch editions. Like the SUV, the pickup launch edition will begin shipping in August while the other two begin deliveries in January of 22. So Tom, uh, how do these prices strike you? And are you surprised they didn't start production with the 400 mile uh, battery first? I know a lot of customers are disappointed by that decision. Uh, you know, it was a little surprising because it seems like everybody starts with the most expensive, biggest battery version um, and because uh, because it's the most profitable. Um, but I, I actually like this. I, I think the 300 mile version is going to be the most popular, in my opinion, uh, for price wise. I think most people are going to realize that 300 miles for, for most people is is the same as 400 miles. You're, you know, especially if you have the ability to charge it at home, there really isn't that much of a, of a difference. And why spend that extra money for that huge battery if you don't need it? Um, you know, the and the launch edition was also a little surprising to me that it didn't, it doesn't do much to um, differentiate itself from the regular adventure. It just has the green color. Uh, you get pr uh, priority delivery and a wheel upgrade. Uh, that, that, that's it. You re it's, they didn't make one that was like $10,000 or $15,000 more and just load it with all kind of badges and stuff and everything. Um, you know, it's typical Rivian. They're very grounded. Like the, the, the company doesn't try to do these wild, crazy things. Um, and, and I like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm a little surprised, but I, but I shouldn't be surprised now that, I, now that I think about it. Um, and, uh, we're finally going to get, uh, you know, Rivian's eight months away from, from delivering trucks if they hold on to the schedule. And that's awesome. We've all been really waiting for this, these vehicles. Yeah. And it looks like they're finally here. Looks to me like it's a pretty darn good value at that pr at that price point. And, um, you know, I, I, I expect Rivian to, to really sell the heck out of these. The only thing that's a little disappointing to me, and we knew this, nothing that we're learning now is, um, you know, th this is an, an adventure vehicle. It's not a work vehicle. Um, you know, and I weighed my options as, as I've said in the past, I, I want to have an electric pickup truck. I have a Toyota Tacoma now. Um, uh, you know, the bed in the back being only, you know, a little longer than four feet, four and a half feet, I think. Four and a half, yeah. Yeah, really limits um, the usability for me. Um, and I think for a, a, a good number of people, although it's it's not going to be a problem for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, this is a, it's a deal breaker. It's going to be a deal breaker for some people that want to kind of use it for both work and adventure. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great package and I, I can't wait to, to get behind the wheel of one of these and drive it. Maybe if I do, I'll, I'll, I, I won't mind the short bed and I'll figure out a way of using it. Uh, but cool. for now, my cyber truck reservation is not in jeopardy. Right on. Hey, so one thing about that bed that I realized that it's, it's really quite deep. Like when you see it in person, you think, well, that's kind of a big bed, but it's because it's super deep. So the, the, uh, the bed is like 4.5 feet long, but if you lower the, it's like 54 inches, if you lower the tailgate, it adds like 30 inches somehow. That's like two and a half feet basically. So it's like, uh, do the math. It's longer. <laughs> and so, yeah, you, you can, you can put in like, a, you know, an eight foot, it will hang over a little bit, but not enough that it's going to, you know, be an issue. Uh, I didn't check the width, so I'm not exactly sure if you can get plywood in there or not, but I think, I think it's going to, yeah, I think it's, I, I thought it was like 50 inches the width, but okay. I don't know if that includes the wheel wells. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you should be able to, it's definitely wider than 48 inches. So you should be able to, even if you have to rest them on the, uh, the, the wheel wells right you need you need 48 inches between the wheel wells basically. unless unless you use like um they they sell these things to lift up the the behind the wheel wells and then you could rest stuff on top of it uh -huh. nice i need to look into that um okay uh so uh so any of this any change spec changes that you noticed kyle 
Uh, nothing really, but I, I'm oh. so excited about this vehicle. You know, it's it's really something I really want to have in the driveway, and and particularly the R1S. Actually, I think it's just uh, going to work better for us with the dogs and everything. But this is a strong consideration for 2021, uh, getting a Rivian in. Uh, I, I think the R1S might be a contender to enter the driveway for a maybe a year long term or something like this. So we'll have to uh, try it out. And very excited. I uh, can't wait to take it on some adventures. It is a true three row SUV. And if you look at it, it's a little shorter than the R1T, the, than the pickup truck. And if you looked at, at the uh, the departure in, in angles of it, like you look at the, at the thing in the profile, um, it just looks like a pretty it's going to be pretty awesome for like a light off-roading maybe yeah, why off-roading. would you buy a range rover after this is out i mean we'll find I out would. we're gonna it's that's the big comparison here do you buy a a full-sized range rover uh supercharged or you know they're they're, they're in line six now with the new turbo or and they also have a plug-in hybrid which we've done a review on uh sure. or do you buy the r1s that's going to be the big thing here because uh, people buy Range Rovers not to go off road, but to right. just know they could go off road if they really wanted to. Right. And the R1S will be much the same. It's a big market. Um, I I really hope the Rivian can can hold up to that because that that's a big thing. Well, the the R1S won't have like the maybe the level of luxury, but I still think the interior is, is really sweet because it's really suited for that ad- adventure spirit. But the zero to sixty in three seconds. <laughs> Come on. It's like, yeah. it's, it's a super truck. I mean, yeah. man. And I the cargo know. space is fantastic on this yeah. vehicle. You know, with the huge front and the tunnel is, um, you know, really useful. The, 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 right. Yeah. The only thing I will say about the, the, the front is the, um, it, you have to lift stuff up really high to get it over the front That's grill. True. Right. Um, I loved how the, the Hummer has that front grill that folds forward like yeah. a tailgate to slide stuff in and out of. Cause I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not that tall. I'm only five, eight and I, I've, I've been, I stood in front of the Rivian many times and you know, the, the front of the hood comes, the comes up to here. So, you know, I could just imagine picking something up to get it in there and then not being able to lift it out. So, you know, that, that, that's, it's a huge front. I mean, huge, but, um, you're, you're not going to load heavy stuff in there or you're going to have a hard time getting it out. All right. Hey, so we're, we're at a time, but hey, Kyle, can you, th- can you put up the, uh, Kona electric real quick? I just wanted to say that the, uh, mentioned that the Hyundai Kona electric is for 2021. It's getting a refresh and it looks pretty good. It looks like, as you see on the screen, uh, I don't know if we can scroll down and take a look at the interior as well. Cause the interior is kind of like in the back looks kind of nice. They restyled the back and the front and then redid the interior, which now looks a lot more premium. And, uh, I think this is, it keeps it really in the, in the game, I think for 2021 and beyond next couple of years because uh, like on the inside of these form we have a, a very active and very smart actually hyundai kona community and uh, yeah if you're interested in this vehicle definitely go over the inside EVs form and check it out and yeah this is what you have to look forward to for 2021 and yeah i don't know i'm pretty happy about it anyone want to say no anything spec real quick? changes right sorry no specs change no, I think the I think the bat they haven't officially changed the range, but I believe the they're now making them in in uh, the Czech Republic or Czechia or how you pronounce it, and um, I think that has like a slightly bit more battery in it. But basically, it's you know. Well, I think the range was fine. It was more the charging yeah. speeds that always drove me nuts. You know, I've done probably ten thousand miles in Kona EV now, and it's just that seventy two kilowatt. It's like first off, it's better than the Bolt at fifty five, but sure. it's not better than like anything else it needs to be 100 plus that's i mean we're we got to be that's the modern era like even like 130 is kind of like okay we can maybe let it slide so uh yeah i i think this is this is the biggest drawback of kona it's also kind of small kia nero is a better size i think yeah. but if you're just a single person or you and, and your partner need an electric small easy to get in and out of uh, hatchback, lifted hatchback thing, small SUV. This is fine for that. Yeah, but the it has Nero more, is much more usable. Has more range than Nero, and I would argue okay. it looks a lot better than the Nero. Oh no, uh, uh-uh, sorry, not <laughs> not gonna let you take that one. This looks not good. Um, first off, it was pretty bad before, and now it just doesn't look any better. Um, it just looks different. So, uh, yeah, I think it looks better, but you're wrong. 
Okay. I yeah, prefer right. the previous front grill to this grill. I know it's cleaner, oh, but right. I just I liked I liked how the other one looked. Uh, I really liked that like honeycomb look in the middle. While this right, is cleaner, cool. I preferred that, but I do like the fact that the wheel uh, arches now are are color coded. In the past, they were black. Mm. The, the the black the plastic pieces that went over the wheels. I never really liked that. Um, I, I I I like this that it's color coded better. Um, and the charging, as Kyle pointed out, is the big is is really that and the rear seat leg room. It's got very poor yeah. re rear seat leg room um, uh, are the two things that would prevent me from getting a Kona. And I really thought about getting one before I got my Model 3. OK, well, one, one thing about the front end uh, detailing that they have in, in the early ones, I just can't imagine like washing all the bugs off flat and getting all the, you know, the textured finish. Man. That was annoying. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Anyway, so uh, what we aren't talking about this week is uh, so in, there's a made in China Lotus SUV that will be electric and have 750 horsepower. Uh, if you check uh, check over this uh, week's Inside EV stories and you'll see that the Chevrolet has teased the Bolt EUV and uh, showing out a little bit of its interior, which will also give you a, a little bit of an idea what the Bolt EV refresh interior will look like. It's kind of in, in that same ballpark there. And see ford is planning a new ev on using the mustang a mach -E platform so i'm i'm thinking it's probably going to be a lincoln of something probably not quite as sporty but that's something that we'll keep an eye on for and of course uh, the tesla model 3 battery is now larger than it used to be at 82 kilowatt hours and we'll have one of those <laughs> tom pretty soon i hear and we'll do some winter uh 75 70 mile an hour range test and some charging tests and we're really looking forward to seeing how the the this latest version of the model 3 holds up all right so that brings us to the end of our show i'd like to thank you all for joining us if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show you can comment on the inside evs podcast post the youtube comment section or on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Ciao. <laughs>